focusing on a certain part of it. And essentially, I'm going to be looking at uh, zebra mussels, which are an invasive species that have been introduced into the Great Lakes recently. And I'm going to be looking at the effects that it has and the trophic cascade, which uh, has occurred because of that uh, in certain areas of the Great Lakes, and all of the impacts which it has. So the climate which is found there is the humid continental climate. And so that means that they have uh, cold winters and warm summers. Uh, but because of the very, very large amount of water which is there, in fact, has a moderating effect on the climate. So all that water changes a little bit how the climate works in this particular area. So because the water uh, keeps the heat better, that means that all of the area around the Great Lakes will be a little warmer in the winter. So on this map, I put a few cities that you might recognize, and I put the Chinese names so that you might be able to recognize them better. So we have Chicago here, uh, Toronto, and where I'm from is Ottawa. So it's all the way up here. Uh, and in fact, because of the lake effect caused by the large amount of water from the Great Lakes, it means that people that live in Toronto here, uh, their winter is significantly warmer than the winter that I had in Ottawa, where it's much colder. Uh, and at the same time, their summer is a little cooler, so it doesn't get as hot in Toronto as it does in Ottawa, where I'm from. So I guess I get, I'm a little unlucky in that way. Uh, something else that the lake effect does, uh, it also, uh, because of that moderating effect, and so those are very large algae, uh, and those are often the home, they can provide habitat for a lot of organisms which live here, like sea stars, for example or even just for fish, because it provides a lot of protection. Uh, but also it provides for protection and for food. So those fish will eat the macrophytes, which is one very simple food chain there. Um, and there's also a lot of decomposers which live in that area, uh, which will feed on dead matter um, that just gets lifted down, that gets sedimented down uh, from the top of the lake to the bottom. Uh, there's also a lot of filter feed. So what a filter feeder is, it's an organism uh, like this one here, like these large mussels here. And what they do is they consume, well they, they suck in a lot of water. And then from all that water that they suck in, uh, they filter it and they capture all the fine particles that are floating in the, in the water. And so that's how they get their food, they filter the water and they eat the fine organisms uh, which are in the water. And often those are uh, phytoplankton. So similarly to what the zooplankton eat, a lot of the filter feeders will eat as well, and they will consume essentially everything that's in the water. And because phytoplankton is floating in the water and it's very small, it will get into those filter feeders, into those mussels, uh, and it will eat them there. So that's how the ecosystem more or less normally works in the Great Lakes. Uh, now I'm going to be talking about a slightly different topic, uh, which is zebra mussels. So zebra mussels are a type of muscle like this. Not a muscle like you see in your body, but a muscle like a kind of uh, shellfish. Uh, so these mussels, uh, particularly zebra mussels, are originally from Europe, and they are a filter feeder, which is the type of organism which I just discussed, which sucks in water and which feeds on everything that's floating in it that's very small. Now these are very small animals. So this, even though it looks big, this is only one centimeter, so they're maybe about the size of your hand. So they're very small, but they have a very high reproductive rate. So that means that they lay very, very, very many eggs. In fact, one adult female can lay up to one million eggs every year. So, of course, not all of the eggs survive, but that means that there's this very, very, very large growth potential. It means that they can make many children very fast. Uh, and those are originally from Europe, but in 1988, uh, they were brought over uh, into the Great Lakes uh, in one of the ships that was bringing cargo. So it was found inside, uh, essentially inside the ship and it got released when the ballast opened. Uh, and it was found in one of the, in the lakes. And then by 1990, so just two years later, you could find zebra mussels in all of the Great Lakes. So they reproduced in 
very quickly uh, and started to become quite a bit of a problem. Now, those zebra mussels uh, have quite an effect uh, and quite an impact on the trophic system, and that's what I'm going to be discussing uh, right now. So, the first effect is that if there's a lot, a lot, a lot of these filters here, a lot of these new zebra mussels, they're going to be going a little everywhere. They're going to be feeding on absolutely everything that they can. They're going to be reproducing very quickly, and they're going to end up being everywhere. And what happens when there's a lot of filters here is there's going to be a lot of water that gets filtered. And that water that gets filtered means a few different things. First of all, it means that uh, there's going to be less phytoplankton. Because the phytoplankton is what lives in the water and what filters the water. So if there's enormous amount of zebra mussels that are filtering the water, that means there'll be much, much less of this phytoplankton which is swimming, which is not swimming, which is floating in the water. So if there's less phytoplankton, well, there is something that feeds on that phytoplankton, uh, which is the zooplankton. So if there's less phytoplankton, that means that the zooplankton won't have as much food. And so there will be less zooplankton because it won't be able to survive, it won't be able to feed itself. Now, similarly, if there's less zooplankton, that means that the fish which feed on the zooplankton won't be able to feed itself very well either. And so that means that the large fish will also be affected. So just from the simple introduction of small muscles the size of your thumb, of your thumb, of your nail, uh, that means there'll be a lot less fish in the ocean, in the Great Lakes. But that's only a very small thing. In fact, uh, the more important impacts uh, relate to something else. So, it's a little complicated, so I'm going to try it out. So, if there's less phytoplankton, less of the little, the little plants that are swimming in the water, that means that the water will be a lot, it will seem a lot cleaner uh, because there's less stuff floating in it. So, it's essentially, it, it filters the water, it makes it clean. And a cleaner water uh, means that the sun, instead of just being able to go maybe this far because it gets basically blocked by all the phytoplankton, well, it's clean. A clean water means that the sunlight might be able to go much, much farther. And so areas where nothing was able to grow before on the bottom of the lakes, now there can be macrophytes and all kinds of organisms on the bottom of the lakes, which can now survive and which can now grow and develop. They're able to live at the bottom of the lakes. And that means that there's more habitats, because these macrophytes, they serve as habitats for many of the fish and many of the organisms which live at the bottom of the Great Lakes. And so that means that that habitat, uh, that area is going to be able to proliferate, it's going to be able to grow a lot. So there's going to be a lot more organisms, a lot more fish here, a lot more sea stars, a lot more mussels, unfortunately, as well. Uh, <coughs> that, at the same time, means that there's going to be more fish on this section. There's going to be more ducks as well, because ducks feed on a lot of things that are feeding in this, in this area. And when that happens, uh, then, because there's more of this, let's say there's... I don't know how to write that. Then, <coughs> More ducks, more fish. Well, those ducks and fish, they have, they produce uh, certain bodily wastes. So they have, that, that means there's a lot more nutrients which go in the water. And when there's a lot more nutrients that's in the water, uh, well, that can have a lot of other effects too. So this water here, there's a lot more things. Uh, the nutrients are much higher now. Uh, and the sunlight is able to penetrate much further. And when there's more nutrients in the water, and there's more sunlight in the water, that means that there are certain organisms that have a much better 
better time uh, to grow and to live. So I talked earlier about cyanobacteria, but I haven't really mentioned it yet because normally they don't play such a large role in these organisms. Uh, but now, cyanobacteria, they're sort of similar to phytoplankton, uh, but the bacteria as opposed to the plankton. So we have lots of cyanobacteria, which are here, which you see on some like as well. Uh, but those aren't really affected by the zebra mussels uh, because cyanobacteria tend to live in very large, uh, very large colonies. So what the cyanobacteria do is they don't just live alone. They live with millions and millions of other cyanobacteria, and they live together. And so that means that the little mussels aren't able to, uh, to filter the water, they aren't able to feed on them, uh, because they, there, there'd be too many uh, cyanobacteria that live together in a large colony. So that, that lifestyle essentially protects them from uh, being consumed by the zebra mussels. And so now that the phytoplankton is gone, the water is clear, the cyanobacteria don't really have uh, much competition. And so, especially with the large amount of nutrients that are now in the water, the cyanobacteria will start to grow and proliferate even more. And so what happens there uh, is when there's a lot of cyanobacteria, well, that can lead to algal blooms. Uh, so we talked about this a little bit, uh, and now, in the Great Lakes, it's partly uh, because of this, it's partly because there's a lot of nutrients from human activities, uh, but in the end, the result is the same. All of the cyanobacteria will grow to a very, very large amount and create algal blooms, uh, as well as with other algae uh, that, that happen to be growing uh, because of the activities. Now, that in itself is bad uh, because, first of all, Second of all, it's bad for everything else that exists there uh, because it blocks the sunlight. And also because cyanobacteria often produce uh, some types of toxins, uh, which are bad for everything else that's there. Uh, but even more than that, uh, unfortunately, that's not the end. So what this can cause uh, is a eutrophication. So once there are so many So many bacteria, uh, so many algae, so many algal blooms. Well, at that point, they need nutrients to survive. And if there's too many, well, they're going to start producing all the nutrients. And so there's no more nutrients left, and they can't really survive anymore. And at the same time, there are so many that it blocks the sunlight, so they can't really survive very well because they don't have enough sun. They're essentially just they're choking themselves. They're, they're blocking the sun and, and they can't grow anymore, and they don't have any nutrients. And so what happens then is a lot of it will start to die. So a lot of this will just die and it'll start hanging them. But then, when everything that's here that once was alive is dead, well, it'll start to decompose. And when all of this algae here starts decomposing, well, when things decompose, they use a lot of so normally, there's a certain amount of oxygen which is present in the water. But once it, once there's a lot, a lot of algae and bacteria which decompose, it's going to start to use up that oxygen. And so there's not going to be as much oxygen as there was before. And that, combined with less sunlight, will start killing even more fish, even more sea plankton. And so there's going to be more things that will start dying. And so there's going to be even more stuff that goes down, starts decomposing, and the oxygen level just keeps getting lower and lower and lower. In fact, it can get so low that sometimes at the very bottom of the Great Lakes, there can be certain zones which can be considered to be anoxic, which means that the oxygen content is very, 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 very low. And in those anoxic zones, there can be certain uh, anaerobic metabolisms which develop. So in these zones, you would have very little oxygen. So only certain organisms, which will start to grow, uh, which have anaerobic metabolisms. And what that means, essentially, uh, is that those organisms are different in the way that they don't need uh, normal, I suppose normal organisms which are uh, which have an aerobic metabolism, we can 
consume an oxygen and we let out CO2 something to breathe. But these organisms consume something else and they let out something else too. So a lot of those organisms will consume uh, chemical products, consuming sulfur, for example, uh, and will release uh, things like hydrogen sulfide, which is a toxic gas. So the hydrogen sulfide that we release is a very smelly, smelly gas. Uh, which can be corrosive, which is toxic, and can get released from uh, these conditions just because of the type of organisms which live there. And a lot of those uh, organisms that have anaerobic metabolisms uh, also release a lot of other toxins. Uh, for example, one that's very common in the Great Lakes, that's quite common in the Great Lakes, which causes much problems, uh, releases uh, a botulism toxin. Uh, now, I don't know if you are familiar with Botox, uh, but it's something essentially when you inject something in your face to make your skin look prettier, so when uh, it gets consumed by organisms, when it gets eaten by fish, when it gets eaten by birds, it can have very bad effects. And in fact, there have been, uh, in many areas, there have been many fish that have been floating, uh, that have dead fish that have been found floating on the lakes uh, related to the botulism uh, toxin, and it often kills a lot of birds, and so sometimes you get a lot of birds which are dead, which are paralyzed because of toxins uh, that, that were released from these environments that were caused by this very, very large chain of events. And so, like as I said here, the toxins move up the food chain, and they can kill birds, fish, and it can make it dangerous for people that want to swim in that area as well. Uh, so just to recap, the zebra mussels have a very, very, large effect on the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes ecosystem. So there's the obvious effect that when there's a lot of zebra mussels everywhere, it has bad effects for humans uh, because it, it clogs pipes, it gets in people's boats, it can break equipment, so there's that. But then there's also the ecosystem impacts. So it uh, decreases the populations of phytoplankton, which also decreases the populations of zooplankton, which has an effect on fish, uh, but at the same time, it can, in the short term, have good positive effects towards everything in the benthic ecosystem by providing more habitat because of the growth of these macrophytes. Uh, but then something that is not present in the system uh, is the fact that it can lead to eutrophication, which has very bad effects and which can lead to toxins in the ecosystem. So that's